Okay. So, good morning to you all. I want to take this opportunity to introduce our guest speaker as part of this series on civic engagement. I have been working in the community to bring attorneys and judges in to talk about civics and their careers. Uh, part of that, as you already know, is that during the month of October, we'll focus on the legislative branch. Right? Thus, yesterday's pop quiz on the legislative branch. In November, we will talk about the judiciary. And in December, the executive branch. So, uh, along those lines, let me introduce to you uh, Ms. Helen J. Ferraro Zafram, who is an attorney that specializes in the area of public interest law, namely elder law. Seniors in our country have a series of issues, whether it's involving Medicare, senior abuse, uh, and she and her office specializes in this particular area, right? Um, I, I think it is appropriate to say also that she is family and the mother of Miss Saffron who teaches here at Frederick Law Olmsted. I'm hoping that when she's done with her presentation, and she may even have a couple of follow-up questions based upon yesterday's pop quiz. But at the end, please have a few questions for her. Some of those questions might involve, what, what was your decision making process in terms of becoming an attorney? What's the average day for you? How long have you been in practice? What law school did you go to? What college did you go to? Was the bar exam hard? So please have some questions for her when she's done with her presentation, okay? So without further hesitation, let me introduce our guest speaker for today, Ms. Helen Ferraro Saffron, attorney at law. Oh boy, thank you, thanks. Nice, thanks, warm, everybody. Olmstead, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, thank you, Mr. Crump, for uh, allowing me to come today and to speak to all of you. Um, I, I wanted to, he, he was kind enough to send me the quiz in advance, and I even got one wrong myself, so I, I, I have some learning to do. Um, as he's already told you, there's three branches of government. There's the executive, the judicial, and then the legislative branch. And you guys are now working about the legislative branch. Um, I didn't tell him, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the judiciary as well, because I had the honor of meeting a former Supreme Court justice. So I brought a picture for you to see that. And we'll see if you can guess who that justice is. Um, so the legislative branch, we speak about Congress. Can anybody tell me the two branches of Congress that you would have kind of learned about in the quiz? All right, this gentleman right here. Very good. And that makes up the entire Congress, of which Mr. Crump was saying there's 435 members, right, that vote on any given legislation. When we talk about the representation, how many states are represented in the legislature? 50, correct. And so as far as Congress members, does every state have the same number of individuals in Congress who are in the House of Representatives? Yes or no? No. And what's that based on? Population. Population. Very good. All right. As far as the Senate goes, is that different? Yeah. Yes. Yes. And how many do we have in each state representing us in the Senate? Two. Two. Correct. So the idea right, is that there's some equality relative to the Senate having two regardless of size of population, whereas with Congress, 
that's based upon the population in that state, in the district, right? So each district, they kind of reapportion based on the population in each of these states and how many people um, are living there at any given time. Why do we do all this with the three different branches? The whole idea is to have some type of balance of power so that not one branch is able to exert so much power that it ends up basically tumbling our democracy. So when the Constitution was drafted, the founders put in a bunch of different protections so that each of these three branches were not able to usurp complete control. Anybody have questions about that? Understand why that's so important? Yes. Oh, how come they were they were giving people to well, because then we would have something called a dictatorship, right? And that's not the fundamentals of our country is a whole democratic model. All right. So what does the legislative branch do? It basically is the branch that helps to create new laws that we call legislation. And I'm sure you'll talk about how a bill can become a law and all the back and forth and the compromise that ends up occurring relative to that happening. And the whole, I mean, bills can be tabled for years, they come back. Um, there's a whole host of different opportunities that both sides have, right? So we talk about partisanship, bipartisanship. Does anybody know what partisanship means relative to when we're talking about politics? Okay. So basically when we're somebody who's very partisan, we are, we're a firm advocate relative to our party. So we have a number of different parties. The main two parties are Democrats and Republicans. I'm sure you're all familiar, we're gonna be having the um, election for President of the United States in a week from Tuesday, right? So the two main candidates, Trump is a Republican, and so the Republican Party oftentimes had a, has a set of ideals, missions, goals, and then Kamala Harris, who represents the Democratic Party, the Democrats, Right, so the Democrats have set of goals and ideals as well. And so when someone's very partisan, they're very set in the ways of whether it's Democrat and independent is another group um, or Republican. And so when they're partisan, they don't like to oftentimes compromise. Right, so they want, to, they want, it's my way or no way. When you're bipartisan, the idea is you can support other beliefs and missions and ideas. And we say oftentimes in Congress, you reach across the aisle, right? You reach to your opponent, if you will, somebody who's a Democrat but you're a Republican or vice versa, and you come together compromising to come up with legislation. And over the last several years, we've kind of seen an impasse. And that crossing the aisle and being friendly to a Democrat or a Republican who doesn't see the, exactly the way you do isn't always happening. So the hope is, right, that going forward, we can come back to more of a bipartisan approach to politics so that we're able to pass legislation and get things done. Because when we're so partisan, oftentimes there's an impasse. And that impasse then doesn't allow us to go forward with coming up with new rules and laws. What happens, do we know, so when a bill is passed by Congress, 
The president has, do we know what it's called? What kind of power to override that? Yes. A veto, very good. So the, the president, that legislation can come before the president and the pre president can say, I'm not agreeing to this, no. And then do we know what happens after that veto? Yes. Like half of the people have to agree on it for it to like pass? It can go back again, yes. And then there has to be an override and is it, well, boy, Mr. Crump, I didn't look up. Is it two thirds to override, or is it half plus one on a veto? I'm, I think it's two thirds. Two thirds, I think. I will double check that. Yeah, right I'm sorry. Fact check. I should have, I should have looked at that better. But I believe it's two thirds vote, so it can still happen even if a president. Again, the whole idea of balance of power, right? And not having one branch being able to usurp and have total control. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the judiciary and the judicial branch. The judicial branch is under Article 3 of the Constitution. Pardon me, Mrs. Afram, it is two-thirds. It is two-thirds, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And, and so under Article 3 of the Constitution, the judicial branch, and so we have Supreme Court justices that end up being selected by the president relative to, that's the highest court in the United States, is the Supreme Court. And there's no set number. The number has gone, it's been as few as six, and currently does anyone know how many justices sit on the Supreme Court? Anyone? Mm -mm. It's nine. It's nine. And there's a chief judge, a chief justice, and then there's eight associates. Does anyone know who the chief justice of the Supreme Court is? It's John Roberts. So he's the big cheese of the Supreme Court and then there's eight associate judges. So I had the opportunity to meet a Supreme Court justice. And here's the picture. And I'll pass it around, you guys can look at it. And this is the Supreme Court justice. So look at it and see if you could tell me the name of who that justice was. It's the woman in the center in the black and white sitting. I brought some treats. Is that okay, Mr. Crump? I was going to give them for right answers, but they can. It's okay as long as they use it and eat them in the classroom. Okay. Thank you. You want to open them? Uh huh. Yeah. Does the Supreme Court have a jury? No, the Supreme Court does not have a jury. The question was, does the Supreme Court have a jury? No, basically the cases that come to the Supreme Court, which is the highest federal level of court, are oftentimes cases that have come up through the court system and then ultimately are heard by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court oftentimes selects the types of cases that they're going to hear and that then attorneys who are able to come in front of the court to argue basically stand in front of all of the justices who sit high above wherever you're going to be um, and make their arguments to the court. All right, we'll wait till it goes around to see if you guys can tell me who that judge is. So it's not every day that an attorney even comes in front of the Supreme Court. Most attorneys who practice will never go to that high level of court to make an argument. However, um, 
it's really an honor as an attorney to be able to be in the presence and meet somebody who's a justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. All right, does anyone know the name of that judge? All right. Her name was Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And I have a little book that my husband got for me that's really more done in a comic kind of sense. But this was a justice who, when she went to law school, maybe 4% of all lawyers were females. Now, today in law school, it's it, women, I think, are even over 50% in most law schools, right? So when she was really a trailblazer, and when she got out of law school, there were not law firms, despite her intelligence, despite where she was in the top of her class, um, she had a really difficult time getting a job. And so when we talk about you know, women in the law, to be somebody who was able to get to the Supreme Court of the United States, that's really a big deal. Um, and so currently, we have several women that are, have been appointed to the Supreme Court. So we're really fortunate and lucky. Um, when I started out after law school some 35 years ago, um, there were not a lot of women when I practiced, so I oftentimes practice in the Supreme Court of the state of New York, not the big Supreme Court in Washington, D.C. But oftentimes, when I appeared, I was the only female relative to all the attorneys that would be present for something. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about you know, the whole educational process. Is anybody interested in the law or perhaps pursuing um, a job or profession in the law like an attorney? Okay. All right, so after high school, then you go to four years of college. And after college, there are several different programs now. There's three plus three, which allows three years of college and then three years, and at the end of the six years, you get a combined degree. But oftentimes it's four years of college, and after that, three years of law school. And after going to law school, that doesn't end it. You then have to take the bar exam for whatever state, whatever jurisdiction you're gonna want to practice in and pass the bar exam. And then, even after all of that, there's a character and fitness portion where you actually meet with an attorney who's on the committee to make sure that they're willing to say, yes, you should become an attorney and you can practice. So it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of commitment. There's a lot of studying, obviously, that's involved in all of this. But education, and you know, if there's anything I can impart to you, no matter what you choose to do, no matter what field you choose to go into, education is something that is always going to help you, no matter what field. So there's a lot of people who go to law school, who go to professional schools after college, and maybe they never practice in that field, but the knowledge that they've gained is certainly something that you can always apply to other things. Um, with law school, and Mr. Crum can speak to this, I'm sure, to talk about the importance of critical thinking and how you're given different ideas and how do you solve this problem? How do you, how do you get from A to B? And that critical thinking has allowed me over 35 years, right, to help individuals when they come and they say, 
you know, Ms. Zafram, I had to go to the hospital. I was in the hospital for uh, three weeks, and then I had to go to a skilled nursing facility for rehab. And my insurance said they're not going to pay. And I have now a $70,000 bill. Can you help me? Right? So being able to think, not only understand the rules and the regulations and how we can get these things covered for that, but to also be able to apply that and maybe think outside the box sometimes to allow them to ultimately then be able to not have a $70,000 debt hanging over them that they're not gonna be able to pay. Many of the people that we end up helping are of low to medium incomes and they don't have all kinds of savings to be able to just go to the bank and write a check for $70,000 to pay for their health care. So the idea that you can then look at all the different options and be able to say to them, here's what we can do to try to help you. You know, we might not be successful, but we may really be successful because when you went from the hospital to the nursing home, you know, you got physical therapy every day. Um, sometimes people have feeding tubes. Sometimes people are very, very sick and it should be covered based on their insurance. All right, does anyone have questions for me about the kind of work I, I've done or? All right, he was first. Go ahead. Um, what made me, like, when did you choose to go into law? Um, it was probably in high school. We, we did some things with having to make arguments in front of the class, and I really enjoyed that. Um, so I think it was during those years that I thought, you know, I like this. Yes. Is the bar exam difficult was the question. Yes, it's very difficult. I think that, so you study for months. It's a two-day exam, part of it. There's another part that you take many times when you're in law school. Um, it, you, can, you feel like if, when you're ready to walk into that exam, if somebody came up to you and gave you one more piece of knowledge, you would say your head was going to explode, that you couldn't, <laughs> Mr. Crump is agreeing. Your head is so full of all the different things, right? You're taking three years of all kinds of law that you've learned, having to understand that. And, and this is no open book exam, right? So um, you're packing all that knowledge that you've learned in your head to then hopefully put on paper and answer the right multi-state questions that are A, B, C, D, that oftentimes you can get down to two answers and then it's sometimes hit or miss if you pick the right one. But is it worth it? Yes, it's worth it. It's worth it because you know, you're able to basically provide for your family. There's all different types of law. Public interest law is not uh, a law where you're going to make all kinds of money, but the reward that you're given to be able to help others who but for an agency like Center for Elder Law and Justice, they would not be able to have an attorney to represent them in most situations because they would not be able to afford a private attorney. Yes. Did you ever think about quitting while doing school? Did I ever think about quitting while doing school? I, n I never wanted to quit, but there were times throughout, I, I did not go to law school here, I did not go to UB. I went to St. Louis, I went to St. Louis University, and so I was away from home, and that was hard, but I guess I saw the goal, and I saw the end, and I kept, that in my sight all the time, that this is what you want. This is worth crying over, uh, maybe not getting the best grade that you thought you would get in a course, but that in the long run, it was going to be worth it. And anything worth it, you're going to have ups and downs, right? Yes? What was the most difficult thing about being an attorney and 
um, what did it take for you to get to where you are now? So what was the most difficult thing and what did it take for me to get where I am now? I think the most difficult thing is to see when injustice has been done to a client, to a group, and that regardless of the effort and you know your belief that this was wrong, that it's not always right, right? It's not always corrected. Um, and sometimes we're able to get a partial correction of something, but not the full. And even going up, you know, to appeal something, um, or at some point the client may say, you know what, it's not worth it anymore. I don't want it. And then the client says no. And that's hard too when when you give them different options and they choose the option that's not the best option for them, but because they have capacity and they understand the risks and benefits. And as an attorney, I have to give them all options. I, you know, I always try to say that the best option, that, in my opinion, is one. But if they pick three, um, I go with that, right? So that's hard too. Um, how I got to where I am, well, right now, so in July, I retired, but I'm back part-time helping the agency. So I went from being a law school graduate to a staff attorney to then a supervising attorney to when I left the center, I was the managing attorney for all of the attorneys. So we have approximately 80 employees and we have three offices. Our main office is downtown and then we have an office that's in Cattaraugus County in Dunkirk and another office in Lockport which is in Niagara County. So we serve the Western New York area which consists of eight different counties and we're able to help people in all those counties. Any other questions? Yes. I guess, in part, I really, I well, I like to argue. I guess so. That was a good thing. Um, I like the the idea of having to think on my feet and to come up with solutions to problems. And. Um, I just, I had seen other attorneys. I do not have attorneys in my family. Um, my parents, my, my father had gone to like a business school, but my mother had only a high school diploma. Not that there's anything wrong with just a high school diploma. But for both my parents, education was very important. And they saw that the, the more education that you are able to have, the, the higher the goals you often are able to aspire. And so my father worked two jobs in order um, for me to be able to go to school, for him to pay tuitions and all the rest, which he didn't have to do. But um, there were three daughters and for each one of his daughters, he just, and my mother, saw the importance for education. So how many years have I been working in law? I started at the Center for Elder Law and Justice when I got out of law school, which was 1984, and I've been working in law ever since. I guess you could say I like it. Anything else? Yes, Mr. Cohn. What's a typical day like for you, Ms. Afram? So prior to my retirement in July as the managing attorney, um, it, when you go into management, it's a lot different than when you're a staff or a supervising attorney. So in management, every day was kind of putting out fires, right? And so um, they bought me, you know, when you go to a meat counter at a deli and there's a take a number, um, they bought me a take a number. So people would stand outside my office and, you know, one by one come in with different issues. What kinds of issues? Well, 
Sometimes attorneys make mistakes. They miss a deadline. So there's malpractice issues that have to be considered. There's issues when the attorney says, I really feel the client, you know, we, we may need to withdraw in this case because the client either has done something that they failed to tell us about or things like that. So there's those kinds of issues. Um, there's, because of public interest, we do not have set funding. So there's different grants, there's different opportunities that the agency pursues. And so as a managing attorney, sometimes you're the person who has to go to meet with, we have medical legal partnerships. So we have the attorneys and paralegals at Buffalo General, at ECMC, and at Oshai Children's Hospital. So to kind of get those groups to say yes we want you here on our campuses we want help um, you know we're willing to give you a little money to do that sometimes you're the face of the agency to go out to do all of that as an attorney helping clients it's meeting with clients it's understanding what the issues are framing the issues and then depending on what kind of issue it is where do we go with this? Is it to court? Is it an administrative kind of appeal? So that's a whole different ball of wax as to how you appeal those determinations versus that you're suing in court. We also have a guardianship unit where our office serves as the guardian for approximately 100 individuals making all their medical decisions as well as their financial decisions. So it would not be unlike on a weekend to get a call at three in the morning to say that one of our clients fell, broke their hip, and we had a consent to surgery for them. As a professional, and no matter what profession you choose to go into, you are not nine to five or eight to four. I think it's very important that you understand that being a professional means you're available at other hours. Not that you're available 24-7 unless you know, you're going into a resident program to become um, a doctor and you're on call for a 24-hour period. But that you know, people's problems don't, don't fall into 9 to four, 5 or 8 to 4. Anything else? Yeah. Final question. Yeah. So, um, in terms of what you do, and thank you for coming out and speaking to our young people, do you believe that internships, whether they're paid or unpaid, are important to provide exposure to youth? And are there opportunities like that, internships, paid or unpaid, with the Center uh, for absolutely. Elder Law and Justice? Yes, absolutely. So in my third year of law school, um, most third years take a trial technique course and so there's adjunct professors who come in to teach that course and you do an actual like little tri mini trial, right? They come up with a hypothetical and all that. And during all that, the instructor that I had said, you know, when you leave law school and you're looking for a job and if it's hard to get a job, what I learned and this was his advice, was uh, most people can't say no to a volunteer. So if you offer to volunteer services and help, you may get your foot in the door. And that's exactly what happened to me, 1984, at what was called Legal Services for the Elderly, the same organization, we changed our name and rebranded. I called the director and I said, I just got out of law school. I'm willing to volunteer, even though I couldn't volunteer full time, I volunteered a couple days a week. And that was the foot in the door when they saw you know, my work product and they saw my commitment to their mission. Um, from there, it went on to getting paid positions. Can we give Ms. Zafram a nice round of applause oh, for coming out okay. today. Come on, Olmstead, you can do better than that. Thank her, yes.
Exactly. Yeah, Thank yeah, you so yeah, much. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. All right. Uh, right. You have about two minutes. Or